Hello and welcome to the Amped EV Podcast. My name is David. I am the editor of The Buzz, and today I am amped to be speaking with our guest. It is Kevin Matthews. He is the head of electrification at First Student. Let's get to the interview. Kevin, thank you so much for joining us today and giving us your time. Um, I want to talk about this goal of First Student, the goal of electrifying 30,000 school buses by 2035. Um, can you kind of run us through you know, where did that number come from? Why why is this goal important to you? And then why do you think there's so much momentum in the electrification of school buses right now? Well, first, David, thanks for having us on today. We, we certainly do appreciate that. Uh, the number was not a throw a dartboard at dart uh, or darts at a dartboard uh, approach. It was actually a pretty thorough analysis that we undertook uh, given where we are uh, in the country and in North America in terms of operations. Uh, and so as you look at the states that have mandates uh, for electric school buses, that, of course, drives part of the uptick uh, as it goes there. Uh, and then as you look at our natural replacement cycles of school buses uh, across that time period, uh, that begins to calculate that in as well. But we also believe, you know, this is going to be an issue not like a hockey stick, maybe a little bit shallower than a hockey stick where we have, you know, had 100, 200, 300 you know, a year, uh, 400 a year in the early years here. But then when, when you get to around year 2029, 20, 2030, you know, we'll see a real uptick in the percentage of buses that become electric. Uh, and that really leads to reduction in pricing uh, from OEMs mm -hmm. as volume increases in, in that area. And we believe that will really drive uh, our goal to, to get to the 30,000 by the year 2035. And you, were, you know, why, why the interest in school buses, I think, was your, your, your second question there. Uh, you know, we are ideally suited for electrification. Uh, you know, an average 40 miles in the morning, 40 miles in the afternoon. Now, of course, that's mm -hmm. an average. Things vary greatly uh, from that. But with today's technology, uh, you know, you can service, uh, you know, we've took a, taken a look at the routes we run today. And we conservatively estimate we can do 80% of those routes with existing hmm. technology that, that's in, in the marketplace today. Wow. Now, that's not to say that's cost effective uh, uh, to do. Some of that requires some pretty large charging infrastructure uh, to get the buses fully charged during a, hmm. a midday run uh, type idea, but, it, but it's there. And so I think that's why you really see uh, a lot of folks looking at electrification. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, as I've said, uh, the, the yellow school bus has been the redheaded stepchild of the automotive industry mm -hmm. uh, for a long, long time. Uh, but as we transition to electrification, we actually move toward the tip of the spear. Uh, part of that, I think, is because utilities, uh, mm -hmm. they look at us and say, hey, this is a fleet. It's in every territory in the United States. I mean, you can't miss it. We, school sure. buses are everywhere and in a sizable uh, route, the average uh, school bus fleet is in, anywhere between 15 and 20 buses. So, you know, it's a significant uh, fleet uh, in, anywhere you go. And so that allows the utilities to really figure out how to electrify a fleet with a fleet that you know when it's going to go out in the morning. You know when it's going to come back in the afternoon. You know when it's going to be sitting at night. And I think that's one reason is if you can electrify school buses, you really address maybe as much as 80% of the issues you're going to have electrifying fleets uh, uh, outside of, uh, across the United States. Wow. Uh, earlier, you had mentioned uh, the replacement cycle for buses. Were you talking about uh, school buses in, in general or electrified yeah. school buses? And is there a difference there? School buses in general. So, you know, we generally hold the bus for 12 years uh, and, okay. and then replace them. That's the average life cycle. Uh, we anticipate that electric school buses will also be in that 12-year uh, cycle okay. uh, when it comes to that. But as we begin to potentially electrify the fleet, we may accelerate that replacement cycle as we see cost savings uh, from electrification. And so why continue to operate a diesel bus when we know we can bring in an electric bus that's going to have a, a lower TCO uh, overall? So we may start an earlier replacement cycle. Uh, mm. with some of our fossil fuel units as, as we get in that latter part of the, the 2030 uh, time frame we're talking about. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. What does the typical district uh, coming to first student uh, for help in electrifying their fleet, what, what does that typical district look like? And, you know, what do their, what do their right. goals tend to be? Keep in mind two different types of districts approach us. Uh, one is a district where we provide services to already. Uh, so we own and operate mm -hmm. the school buses there where they're a provider. And so there we have school districts 
that are anxious to get started. They're forward looking. Uh, they want to be at the tip of the spear. Uh, they want to provide this for the benefit of their children and the communities yeah. they operate in. And they're, how can we partner with you to obtain grants and incentives from the utilities? Uh, what do we need to do uh, in terms of your contract in order to meet some of these goals? And so we have that side of the equation. Uh, the second side we have is what we offer to non-customers uh, through our organization called First Consulting. Uh, and that's where school districts who are not customers come to us and want to learn from our experience. We are the largest operator of, of school buses, electric school buses in North America uh, and what we do. And there you often see, you know, school districts that are trying to figure it out, you know, mm -hmm. very early stage of what do we need to do here? You know, how do we pick a bus? Uh, how do we talk to our utility? Uh, you know, some very, very mm -hmm. basic information as it goes there. We are seeing on the other end of the equation a few that have received grants from either EPA or their state government and are now kind of suddenly facing a, a problem uh, implementing, implementing that grant. Mm -hmm. And so coming to us about specific questions around charging infrastructure, mm -hmm. uh, how you deal with this type of situation. Uh, because at the end of the day, what we really bring to the table is operational experience. Mm -hmm. As much as we love electric school buses, uh, our job is still to pick up 2.7 million kids every morning and take them home every afternoon. Uh, and that's in all kinds of weathers. So here we mm -hmm. sit in the middle of winter, uh, you know, in January, we had a polar vortex, which, you know, dropped us well below zero in many places where we, we, we operate. You have to design for that day. You can't mm -hmm. design for the average cold day. Yeah. You have to design for the absolute coldest day because schools often don't close just because it's cold. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, it takes a lot of operational expertise to design the infrastructure to pair with the bus uh, to meet your operational cycle so you get the kids to and from school each day. Very nice. And uh, just out of curiosity, um, you know, a lot of fleets, um, maybe not necessarily school bus fleets, but, um, you know, maybe last mile delivery or, or something of that nature, if when they begin to uh, electrify their fleets, um, you know, oftentimes it can be you know, 12, 18, even 24 months before they can even get started. Does that timeline right. kind of, do you see a similar timeline when it comes to electrifying a school bus fleet or can it be shorter or longer? Yeah, our general timeline, so we still rely on grants uh, to uh, uh, launch an EV school bus into any school district. So from the time we receive the grant to the time we're rolling the bus uh, on routes is anywhere from 12 to 14 months. Okay. Uh, okay. You know, the, yeah, the bus delivery is about nine months from the time we place the order, and that's getting shorter. Uh, usually we're around uh, four, 12 to 14 months for infrastructure okay. uh, from the permitting process, uh, you know, design, permitting, construction uh, usually runs us around 14 months. Uh, now, that's assuming we've done all our homework up front and have picked a location where the utility has uh, service they can get to us relatively uh, efficiently, and we're not doing a major upgrade. Uh, to bring electricity to the site. If that's the case, that of course can lengthen the time frame. For sure. But that's something we do up front. We, we take a look uh, at, at what the utility can do uh, before we start to really jump into anything. And what would you say, you know, I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of similarities between, um, you know, uh, trying to electrify the fleet of school buses and trying to electrify a different kind of fleet and maybe long haul or um, uh, last mile delivery, something like that. But what, what is really the major difference that, that these school districts uh, are kind of facing for school buses? Yeah, but the major difference is this is the single largest change in the school bus industry uh, that will ever, ever occur. Hmm. Uh, and it's a massive transition. And so you've had transportation directors who have been, you know, providing great service to schools, you know, for 30, 40 uh, years. Uh, and this is 100% different, you know, going in with infrastructure because you normally, you know, worse, the most complicated thing you had to do was put in a diesel fuel tank. Uh, and if you didn't want to do that, you could drive down the street to a local gas station mm. and, and buy the diesel fuel. Uh, now you're dealing with it and you're really having to put the uh, infrastructure on your location. Uh, and so it's totally different. Uh, and it's a skill set that many school districts do not have. Uh, they don't have electrical engineers uh, in, in, the, in the school system, you know, mm -hmm. let alone, you know, a lot, a lot of last mile folks will have electrical engineers just from warehousing and other things uh, they're doing. So this is totally foreign to them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's a big curve. 
Uh, and so that's why we started offering first consulting to really sit down with those transportation directors, those school officials and say, okay, here's what you need to do in order to do this and be successful at doing it. Gotcha. Gotcha. And so when, whenever one of these districts wants to get started, what, what in your experience has been uh, maybe what, one of the biggest mistakes that districts are yeah. making, uh, you know, when they're first starting off, they're excited to get started, but you know, yeah. they, they don't necessarily know what they're doing yet. Yeah. What we've seen and, and, and the US EPA has documented this is they see a grant, they go and apply for it. They win, you know, they just won five, 10 buses to, to come to their fleet. Everybody's excited. Then they call their utility mm. and the utility goes, what are you talking about? You know, right. it's going to be a million and a half, $2 million for us to upgrade service at your location. And that cold water, you know, just comes splashing all over them. So, you know, that's the biggest issue we see is utilities need to talk. I mean, school districts need to talk to their utility before they apply for a grant. You know, they need to understand what the utility can do because many utilities have great programs, you know, make ready programs that cover all or a significant part of the infrastructure. Other utilities have nothing. Uh, and so not only are you going to be paying for cost on your side of the meter, you're going to be paying for cost on their side of the meter. And you need to understand that because that grant may not cover enough of, of you know, the bus and the infrastructure uh, for you to, to, you know, go forward without potentially having to come up with your own resources. Sure, sure. And so, you know, once that district actually does get that ball rolling and, and they get started, what tends to be maybe the biggest pain point, uh, the, the biggest headache when it comes to actually setting all of this up, uh, making sure that uh, their, their entire fleet is operating correctly? What, what seems to be the kind of the hurdle for these districts? Yeah, one of the problems we're seeing is when the Biden administration and, and the bipartisan effort in Congress provided the, the funding, uh, you saw a lot of new companies suddenly appear out of the woodwork uh, as, mm. as school bus uh, uh, companies. Uh, and that has really confused the situation. Uh, and so they're running at school bus uh, uh, operators saying, hey, we can do this. It won't cost you any money. You know, do it this way. You know, and, 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 and they're making recommendations that don't address operational needs. Mm. Uh, so we will see these type of organizations come in and say, oh, yeah, we'll do your charging for you. You know, this charging as a service model or electrification as a service model. Mm -hmm. And they'll say, you know, this, this won't cost you any more than what you're paying for, like, you know, diesel right now. But they're doing it where they're doing, you know, four buses to one charging station or three buses to one charging station. Mm -hmm. And that may work 80% of the time. You know, you may be able to charge overnight and be able to run it. But if that charging station goes down, you just lost three or four buses for runs that morning uh, a type of deal. If it's really cold, uh, and you're having trouble charging, you may not be able to get them all charged up to the level you need to uh, the next afternoon. So what we see is the real hurdle right now is people get electric. That's fine. They get the finance side. The operational side tends to be what's missing. Uh, and so understanding how you marry all those together uh, so that you can get out and pick up the kids each morning and take them home each afternoon uh, is really takes a lot more effort uh, than I think a lot of people recognize right now. Got it. Then I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, one last question for you. Um, let's say there's a district out there, they're interested in, in electrifying their school bus fleet, but you know, they're, they're just not sure if it's going to be right for them. Um, do you have any suggestions or any tips that they might be able to follow that says, you know, okay, I, I think maybe it's, it's time to go forward with this. Yeah. Well, don't let cold weather scare, scare you. I mean, I know we're here in the middle of winter, we operate 280 units in Quebec. Uh, mm. They meet service call every morning, and it's really cold in Quebec. So don't let somebody, you know, be concerned that, oh, it's cold weather. We can't do it here. Uh, you can. Uh, you, you absolutely can. And that's what the existing technology today. Uh, so I think that's the first step is don't let the naysayers scare mm. you away. You know, this can be, it can be done on every route. You know, if you got a 150 mile route and there are school buses that run 150 miles, no, you know, you're not going to be able to do that today. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can start to electrify probably the shortest routes you run uh, just about anywhere mm -hmm. uh, and be successful there. So understand that this is doable uh, and can be done. Uh, once you're beyond that, uh, sit down with your utility, as I said. That's the critical step. Uh, understand what your utility can and can't do for you. Uh, and then from there, start to look at what grants are out there, what incentives are out there 
uh, to start to bring these to you uh, uh, and do that. And then feel free to come to First Student uh, through our first consulting, and we'd be glad to sit down and talk to you and, and do everything from route analysis uh, all the way up to how you should be uh, designing your infrastructure. Very nice. Well, Kevin, thank you so much. Uh, I know I learned a lot here. There, there's a lot to consider, a lot going on when it comes to potentially electrifying a fleet of this size. Uh, so I really appreciate all the tips and information. Well, David, thank you for your time today. Uh, we appreciate getting, being able to get the word out and you know, happy to work with uh, other school districts around the country to make this successful. Absolutely. Take care. Thank you. Have a good day. <laughs> All right, that was a great interview. Uh, just like Kevin said, there is a lot to think about if you want to electrify a school bus fleet, uh, but there are options out there and momentum is definitely building there. Thank you for joining us today. We'll see you next time.